Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Say hello. 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 Um, welcome to the Hub Gallery. My full-time job is opening galleries at the moment. Um, it's an extraordinary little space, this, and today it plays house to some very, very extraordinary photography. And you've all had an opportunity to walk around and see the work of two highly respected and um, quite amazing uh, music photographers. Well, first of all, we've been uh, treated to music by Richie and Johnny from Beaten Tracks, who've played uh, a fantastic selection of, of really uh, uh, amazing um, sort of retro tracks. So, uh, can we have a round of applause for these guys? Kept doing all that for doing <laughs> okay, as you know, we're um, part of the Sapport Jazz Festival today and um, working with Red House Originals and Look Eleven. And also with Sefton Council, we have some members from Sefton team here, events team, Nia, Carolyn. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Um, so you don't want to listen to me, so all I can say is um, let me introduce you to Terry Cryer, to William Ellis, and gentlemen, the stage is yours. Uh, mine's more effective, I'm sure. Mine's <laughs> much more decorative than yours. Good start. It's wishful thinking. So, does anybody want to start the discussion? Because we've not got an agenda or anything in particular. So, I guess, I don't know, Terry, what do you think? If people got any questions about the pictures or... What, what, do, you, what do you think? What, what, what should we do, do you think? No, not really. Yeah. I'd like to talk about people we've met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you first going into photography, Terry. How all of these pictures happened? Oh, well, I'd just come out of the army um, and I'd bought a Rolleiflex uh, in Egypt, which was the state of the art camera in its day. And because of the war reparations, with Germany, they weren't allowed to import this particular brilliant camera into this country. But I bought mine in Egypt when I was in the army. And that enabled me to take really good photographs. And um, I used to go out of bounds uh, from the army camps in Egypt, which is very dangerous, to photograph Egyptian fellahin farmers. And I did one photograph of a, of, a, of a Bedouin woman lifting a veil aside. And it was such a perfect picture. It told me all I wanted to know about taking photographs. It was an inspirational picture. And I came out of the army and went back to Leeds, which was a grotty little town, cobblestone streets. Old men coughing their lungs up in the street, dog shit all over the place, cobblestones, <coughs> gas lights, and you had to sup up in the ale house by 10.20 and out, fish and chip shop and home. <laughs> well, Bob Barclay opened a little jazz club, which was about the second one in the country to open, and a friend introduced me. And it was on till midnight. Well, Chris Barber, Humphrey Littleton, were doing gigs at Bradford, um, Wakefield, even Manchester. And they could come over and get a steak sandwich. So these musicians start turning up. And the Empire Theatre, the Variety Theatre was opening in Leeds and the stars were appearing there. Um, they started coming in, so I naturally started taking pictures. And I'd give the musicians prints when they next appeared, I'd give them a buckshee print. 
and they got into the hands of their agents and they thought, hello, this is a bit tasty. <laughs> so they asked me to cover concerts for them. And they send me three quid for the train fare and I'd go down to Leicester or wherever and start taking pictures. And the strange thing is, are there any photographers here? No? I, I didn't have a synchronising lead, which is a lead from the electronic flash to the camera. That when the shutter opens, it completes the circuit and the flash fires. Well, that little lead broke and you couldn't get another one unless you had a friend in Germany. So I used to work by opening the shutter, firing the flash, closing the shutter. And that gave the, because there was available light impressing on the film, then a flash on top of it, it gives the pictures a certain warmth. And then, because jazz clubs were smoky, they used to give the flash to somebody over there, and I'd open the shutter here, and they'd fire their flash across the smoke so it didn't bounce back at the camera. So I started working with flash off camera. And I was, that picture of, um, who's that pianist, Blue Note? Uh, uh, I forget his name. Very famous pianist at Blue Note. You see the picture on the corner, and over the head there's this, he was a heroin addict, so it's appropriate. <laughs> uh, and that's because I opened the shutter, and having had a couple of pernos, uh, <clears throat> and the, the lights, are describing these curly cues on the film because the shutter's open, because they're very bright. And this frog over here is already in the bloody flash. He's got his tongue halfway down at the woman's ear. On. I said, fire that bloody flash, you prat. <laughs> and he fired the flash which registered the image, but there's this curly cues of light over his head. And everybody thought it was very avant garde. The thought it was deliberate. It wasn't. I was pissed. Nice your turn. Come anywhere near that. Um, I guess I know, for, for me, it kind of started in terms of um, where it's got to now was was with photographing Miles Davis. Which was, was one of the pictures from that session, and uh, I'd done pictures um, at local festivals and some quite, you know, some big names, um, John Dankworth with Cleo Lane and sort of variety artists and Mike Yarwood, uh, Harry Seacombe, um, Julian Lloyd Webber on the cello. Sort of, this is like 30 years ago, and um, so I'd done quite a lot of stage photography and backstage as well, which uh, which have frankly enjoyed more really because it was just so interesting to be kind of at sort of 20 really where you shouldn't be, you know, it's, it's part of the appeal of thing to kind of blag your way in somewhere and just shoot something that you wouldn't normally see and, and something that people wouldn't normally get to get to view in terms of people relaxing and, and just, you know, hanging out and all that kind of feel. But So I, I started to do stage photography in that way. And um, then I kind of left it for some time and did, did other things in the, in the photo kind of world, really. And then uh, I got into listening to jazz and Miles Davis and Duke Ellington and all these guys and a lot of the guys, the originals that, that Terry photographed, um, just wonderful pictures of Muddy Waters and um, all these guys, Lee Connitz, all these amazing characters. A lot of them were still around when I kind of kicked off as well. But then, I heard that Miles Davis was going to tour, and this was 1989. And I'm really, and I'm sure there's a lot of music fans here, that the, the kind of um, character that Miles Davis was and what he represented in terms of jazz, the culture, the whole cool thing, that being um, such a enigmatic pain in the neck, I know from time to time, but I just thought, I've got to photograph this man, this is going to happen once. So um, I knew quite a few people 
on the media side in Manchester, so TV, radio and, and newspapers. So I started kind of scrounging around my contacts to try and get accreditation, to get a pass to, to photograph Miles Davis. And everybody else obviously wanted to shoot the guy. So um, in, I'd already bought like tickets for both nights because you know I never thought I'd ever see him. And I'd say he's probably the only artist um, that, I would, <laughs> that, I would, that I would have done that to, to go and see, such as his status and still is. And um, anyway, I managed to track down the promoter, God knows how, and there was no internet then. I think they kind of just invented the wheel. So somehow I managed to get the promoter and essentially beg him <laughs> to let me photograph for Miles Davis. And he said, okay. And I think probably the fact that I bought like you know, two tickets for two nights, it may have had something to do with it. He was, he was kind of quids in. Um, you know, they would have sold out anyway, just, you know, but... So he said, okay, I'll leave a compliment slip for you at the box office when you turn up. And I was. And so I turned up with enough cameras to, to make a short movie, <laughs> you never mind just shoot ten minutes of a concert. And... It, that photographing Miles, I, I never... I spoke to him once, actually. I, I spoke to him the year later. Um, I never really sat down and spoke with him. Um, this was on, I had a telephone conversation which was kind of surreal, which I'll tell you about later maybe. Um, but that was that was kind of the the big step for me in terms of wanting to um, photograph jazz, the contemporary jazz, and really get into the whole feel of of what people are doing. I think music is such an inspiration. I'm sure Terry found the same kind of thing when when he was photographing jazz. It, it, it's the music and the people um, and very often the lifestyle that they have and, and what kind of influence they have and how they've influenced people's tastes in music, even dress. I mean, Miles Davis in 1989, I mean, if you saw somebody dressed like that now, I'm not saying it's, you know, I wouldn't dress like that myself, but people that are just completely out there being who they want to be, I always find exciting. Um, so really that's sort of photographing Mars is where it started for me and after doing that pictures were published and then I could get access to other festivals and venues and commissions etc. So that's, that's I guess how I started on, on music photography myself. So um, yeah. So, so.